How's everybody doing? Um, so you are here on the inaugural day of numbers therapy. So numbers therapy is going to be this themed set of talks that we're going to have. And the purpose of it is to talk through macro stuff and bring on and showcase our experts in here. And so the goals of numbers therapy, just so you guys know, uh, have it so that everyone can understand how all of the big things fit together, the bigger picture beyond just NFTs. As a result, like make better decisions with NFTs and other investments using a balanced perspective. Um, learn about or from you know some of our people in here, of course, and then learn about different areas and opportunities that exist out there as well, and different ways of thinking. And um, just one disclaimer and note that's worth saying is none of what you hear in here is financial advice. It's all opinions. Um, but without further ado, today we have a crowd favorite on as our guest. Um, his pure expertise focuses on bond markets and related rates, but it certainly extends beyond, as we all know, he's a mentor, he's an analyzer like many of us, but he brings in his background from fixed income and wider markets to influence his decision making. And while having some side fun, as he likes to say with NFTs. And so here is Shaggy. Yeah, great. Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah. As you mentioned, um, my expertise is on the fixed income side, uh, basically been uh, in, in fixed income my entire career. Uh, I will just note that uh, anything I talk about today are, you know, my opinions and my opinions alone. Uh, they're not related with my um, in real life uh, uh, position. So these are uh, purely my opinions uh, doing this on, on my own time. So just to make that clear and also, um, you know, we'll be talking about a lot of things, uh, but, you know, of course, as uh, we always say, not financial advice, uh, you know, this is uh, not investment recommendations. Uh, you'll have to draw those on, on, on your own. Uh, so uh, with that a disclaimer at the top, yeah, let's get rolling. Yeah. And so just one other thing I want to call out too, is that, you know, as we mentioned in, in VC1, there are different levels of, of expertise and, and experience that exist in here. I know some people are going to have more you know, technical questions and some more general questions. It's really important as we go along the way, if anybody has a question, you know, please vocalize it because I want to make sure that we can all be on the same page and kind of carrying through the conversation. So feel free to, to speak up or interject if you have a question along the way. So with that said, Shaggy, why don't you start with you know, a bit on your background as it pertains to bond markets and fixed income and kind of, you know, what you, you know, what, what you tend to do there and, and, and how you touch it, you know, to, to the extent that you want to talk about that. Yeah. So, um, I mean, just kind of a high level, um, a very high level, you know, when you look at uh, kind of the traditional market, uh, tra traditional investment markets, you know, there's two main types of investments are going to be your equities or stocks uh, and then your bonds or fixed income. Um as I mentioned, uh, uh, I've held many different uh, positions uh, throughout my career, always within uh, the fixed income world, though. Um, often, you know, people think of fixed income as kind of the safe, uh, boring world. Um, and typically it is. It's it's far lower risk uh, for the most part uh, than uh, you'll find in equities or certainly, uh, you know, digital assets uh, and NFTs. Um, that said, you know, bonds also tend to be um, quite a bit more complex uh, than you find uh, in some of those other markets. It also is a, a massive market. Um, it, it dwarfs uh, the other markets we've talked about. Uh, so bonds ha have this just massive um, uh, position in global investment markets. And thus you tend to find, um, and maybe my bias talking a little bit, but you tend to find uh, kind of some of the smartest money uh, in the bond markets. Uh, and what they tell you, I think, do tell you a lot about the macro environment uh, and, and what's going on. Um, I imagine a lot of folks uh, here, especially on the younger side, are not going to own many, many bonds. And quite frankly, that's normally uh, the appropriate uh, approach as you have a, a much longer um, investment horizon. Uh, you would probably prefer to take the risk uh, than err on uh, some of the safer assets. But... Um, you know, you can still, uh, by examining the bond market, I think, learn a lot about where potentially those risk markets are, are headed. That's awesome. So, uh, by the way, I, I can't help but enjoy, you know, having you in here kind of dealing with some of the riskiest, highest volatility assets and the contrast between that and, and bond markets. It's awesome when I think about it. But 
Uh, maybe just one other detail that's probably worth pointing out to some people if they're less familiar. Just how do bonds function? Can you just explain like how people in theory or, or institutions make money on bonds and how they function just so we can get on the same page on that as well? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, when you look at how uh, entities um, and, and companies, governments, et cetera, uh, but let's just stick with companies, fund themselves, um, because most companies don't work just on just cash. Um, they'll fund themselves. And there's always a hierarchy, um, you know, in terms of kind of who gets paid back first. Um, and, you know, the first person, if a company has dollars to pay, the first person that's getting paid uh, is going to be uh, someone uh, that has kind of secured assets. So maybe you have a lien on uh, some of their property or uh, some other asset they have. Um, most of the bond market uh, is going to operate in um, kind of unsecured debt. So a company uh, wants to continue to borrow money. Uh, they don't want to uh, obviously secure um, a particular asset against it. But if it's a good credit rating, people are willing to borrow the money. Well, those people get paid back uh, generally second. And these are generalities. Uh, and then uh, you kind of get into equities um, or the stocks. You know, so the, this, the, the, if a company has trouble, you know, a bondholder is going to stand in line uh, to, um, let's just say, own the company or own their assets uh, before equity holders and uh, before uh, people kind of further down uh, the capital structure. So, you know, bonds, uh, that's why they're a safer um, uh, form of investing. You just have a a higher priority on the assets of a company if something goes wrong. Uh, the other kind of unique thing about most bonds, as opposed to equities, you know, equities have this kind of long-term infinite life, if you will. Uh, bonds, um, you know, just like you take out a, a mortgage, you might, you, you have a 30-year maturity, something like that. Well, bonds uh, tend to have set maturities uh, as well. Um, and so if you are uh, borrowing uh, or lending money to a company, you then take hold of that bond, that securitized uh, uh, or unsecuritized asset, and you are basically promised a set income stream. So they may pay a yield or a coupon of, uh, let's just make it up 5%. You'll get 5% a year until that bond matures, and then you will get your money back. And as long as the company is of good credit quality and makes those payments, that is what you're going to get and that is when you're going to get it. Um, now, if you would buy or sell that bond before it matures, uh, then you're subject to kind of what uh, the market price of that bond is. And the easiest thing to think about is interest rates go higher, bond prices go lower. Uh, so there's an inverse relationship there. Um, and um, the opposite holds true as well. So, you know, if you're in a period where you think interest rates are going to be falling, well, then it's great to buy uh, some longer term bonds uh, and lock in those higher rates and, you know, vice versa. Uh, when rates are rising, not the best time to be owning bonds. That's awesome. So just to simplify that for people, right, as an investor or potential investor, right, put money into bond. It's called principal typically, right? And you earn a rate, which it comes in the form of a coupon, it's called. You earn a rate over time. And that's the way it kind of functions as an investor. And so we in here, right, like we may hear, you know, 5% return, like John, like John Satoshi called out. and be not so excited about that. But I think the thing that has to be called out is that there's a different risk profile for bonds too, right? And so, of course, like we're going to be excited in here by crazy returns in short periods of time. And in the market, of course, there's like lots of opportunity right now. Uh, but there is some risk with that, too. And so bonds are certainly like towards the other end of the spectrum in terms of risk. Um, just worth calling out that, that difference there. So, um, OK, so with that in mind, I think we have a, a sense of what bonds are and how bonds can be used for capital as well for organizations. Uh, catch everyone up. Like what's going on in the world? Like how did we get to today? What's going on with inflation rates? Like what are you seeing in general right now? Yeah, well, that's a, uh, a big question. Um, <laughs> and we're at a very um, interesting point in time. Um, you know, ever since the financial crisis, so the financial crisis being 08, 09, um, you know, we had uh, essentially a housing collapse um, and um, 
you know, uh, a real crisis on our hands. Uh, but ever since then, rates have been very low. So interest rates very low and inflation has been very low. Uh, yet, um, due to kind of COVID uh, and, you know, we could go into details why it happened, but um, due, to, due to unique events, um, we now have a period here where inflation uh, is really as high as we've seen it since the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and it's very concerning. Um, and it's a, a very unique uh, period here in time. And I think, um, you know, the one point I do want to get across is that inflation is, it's an enemy. It's an enemy of, um, of economies. Uh, you just cannot have a good economy if you have uh, high inflation. And so, um, you know, we're going to have to combat it and our central banks uh, and our government is going to have to combat it and it will have to win. And um, the potential uh, to uh, the potential of that battle uh, that must be had is uh, is potentially painful. Um, cool. And. You know, I'm not sure there's a great way to avoid uh, some of the pain uh, that's likely uh, likely coming. Uh, but uh, make no mistake at all, inflation is uh, a massive issue, and it's something we have not seen in in 30 plus years. Um, so, um, really, almost 40 years. So, uh, it's something really probably most of us have have never seen or experienced. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Um, so. I guess the obvious question, though, for, you know, probably people are thinking in here, right, is that's great and all like inflation and unprecedented time and, you know, a little bit of strange conditions, of course. But how does that connect to our NFTs and our beloved NFT market as well? Right. Like, can you draw the bridge and, and connect the dot between like what inflation means or could mean or maybe not yet, but could mean at some point as it pertains to NFT markets? Like, can you bridge yeah. that connection? Sure, sure. That's a good question. So I will first say, you know, NFTs, for the most part, um, and I, I know they've been around a while, but really, uh, since they've really become kind of a, a more of a focus, um, and even there's still a very small portion of even digital assets, but it, it, they've been around really less than a year, you know, Board 8 now is only about a year old, not quite a year old. So, um, you know, I, it, it's very like, I can make some assumptions, but nobody can tell you what's going to happen to NFTs through different environments because we've never experienced different environments in NFTs. Um, and so that's one thing I think people should take away from this is that, you know, I mean, NFTs, a very, very young kind of investment classes, if you will, has not been stressed, has not been tested uh, through different environments. So I can make some assumptions, um, uh, but, you know, no one knows for sure. Um, we just don't have history uh, to kind of guide us as we do in many other asset classes. Um, you know, with that said, um, you you know, my assumptions are, uh, and I think I've seen this, uh, you know, definitely over uh, the last uh, six months or so, is that, you know, digital assets, uh, and I'm talking about coins as well here, um, you know, tend to correlate more with risk-oriented assets. Uh, I think we would all agree that NFTs are uh, and digital assets, uh, at least at this stage, are extremely volatile uh, and thus uh, risky. Uh, of course, with risk comes great reward, uh, but also, you know, for every Moonbirds, for every Bored Ape, uh, the field is littered uh, with NFTs that, uh, you know, go to zero um, or close to it. So, you know, that's just the nature of risk. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, this being an extremely risky asset class. Uh, so my assumption is that NFTs will likely follow uh, the risk markets. Uh, and when I say the risk markets, you know, the easiest, the biggest risk markets to watch are uh, the equity and the stock markets. Um, and so this is this is my assumption, uh, how things will play out uh, over time. That makes sense. And so I guess the, the one other thing that's probably worth talking about too, beyond just like the specific market uh, constructs that exist or how to categorize them is also, I guess, disposable income, right? And the impact of inflation on disposable income and then how consequently like how people can use that disposable income. So from a generalized sense, beyond what you're saying too, I guess you probably also say, right, that there's a disposable income in impact potentially 
that could impact people's investments or, you know, need to protect or, or even go the other way potentially, which is people will take a riskier approach in some circumstances. Yeah, no, that that's right. And I think, you know, um, you know, I'll have some concerns uh, that we'll, I, we'll talk about uh, in terms of, of beating inflation, fighting inflation, uh, in, uh, and what we're going to have to do about it. I, I, it. There are some positives out there, too. Um, and one you mentioned are uh, those disposable incomes. You know, we're actually at a point now where uh, the cash uh, or the liquidity, if you will, on consumer balance sheets, uh, and this as it relates to the U.S., uh, is, is near its all-time high. Uh, so, you know, the consumer in the U.S. has come out of uh, COVID and the actions around COVID in really uh, some of the best position uh, they've ever been in. Uh, so that, you know, potentially uh, has some important consequences uh, as well. Um, I do think, you know, as as a side note, uh, you know, the, the, while consumer balance sheets here in the U.S. are very strong, you know, uh, you find those uh, benefits being more in the middle to upper income tiers uh, rather than the lower income tiers. Um, and uh, but inflation, you know, it does eat away at um, balance sheets. And, you know, while job gains here in the U.S., the job market's very strong and, you know, wage inflation is strong. Well, the purchasing power is actually uh, starting to reduce here in the U.S. because inflation is actually higher uh, than wage gains. So, you know, you know, this is where inflation starts to kind of be a bit uh, insidious um, and, and actually starts reducing, reducing kind of this capital on people's balance sheets from a purchasing power perspective. And uh, the same can be said of um, of increased wages. Um, you know, things cost more, even more than your increased wage, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, you, you start to become in a, a lesser position over time uh, from a, a purchasing power uh, perspective. So, you know, these are some uh, very interesting dynamics going on. But uh, yes, the, the high amount of cash on consumers' balance sheets, you know, I do think at least in, in the near term, you know, does provide uh, some tailwind for uh, risk assets. Uh, and I think we've been seeing that um, not only in this space, but in, in equity markets recently as well. So just to you know, replay that for everybody, um, you know, we're saying more cash on consumers' balance sheets. That's more cash in consumers' accounts at this point, consequently, like more money for people to spend. Um, but as Shaggy's saying, as inflation increases and it zooms past potentially what people are earning, at some point it has to eat into that is the point of, I think, what he's trying to make. Um, but for now, you know, the tailwind comment he's making is that still have cash that exists in, in cons consumers' balance sheets in their accounts. And as a result, they can deploy that cash if, if they choose to in, into a variety of things. So, uh, okay. So, and we'll get, I see everybody's questions. We will get to them at, uh, at, at the appropriate time. I just want to make sure we're going top down here. Um, but so, okay. So we have this infl inflation issue that exists, right? Recently, you know, the, the recent metric, I think 8%. Eight, eight ish percent inflation, and maybe that goes up over time for a variety of reasons. So, uh, how, how do we fix this inflation issue? Like, what are the options? I know I've, I've heard you talk about demand side versus supply side. Can you talk to that a little bit more and give people a sense of how do you, you know, I don't want to say fix, but how do you fix inflation and, and how does that get kind of rolled out and, and how, does that, how does that look? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, so the classic definition of inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. Uh, so as you mentioned, there's there's two sides to that equation. Uh, there is the supply of goods uh, that's coming into the economy. And this has been extremely challenged um, because of COVID uh, and more recently because of uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, and, you know, I think the conventional wisdom was that these supply chains would heal themselves uh, and this would help abate some of the inflation pressures, but that has not happened. In fact, it appears that uh, the supply constraints um, are becoming kind of even more elongated. Uh, and what I mean by that, you have China now, uh, and their zero COVID policy is shutting down uh, many, many cities over there, further uh, exacerbating uh, some of the supply chain issues. And, you know, so it just, it doesn't seem like we're going to be able to solve the problem by 
fixing the supply side. Um, and so that leaves the other side, that leaves the demand side. <clears throat> demand, of course, is very strong. That's why we have inflation. Uh, we have healthy consumer balance sheets. Uh, we have very low unemployment here in the US. Uh, we have um, you know, people kind of coming out of COVID, looking to travel, looking to spend uh, money. Um, and, and so you have a lot of, um, you have a lot of money chasing not too many goods <laughs> uh, and services. So this is the problem. And we can't fix the good side because of the issues we talked about. So we're going to have to fix the demand side uh, to bring inflation back down to a level that's acceptable. Yep, that makes sense. And, and I think, you know, for many people in here listening or if anybody sees on the news, right, like a, a 25 basis point, meaning a quarter of, of a percent, hike or, or, you know, 50 basis point, you know, half a percent hike. And you're like, well, that, you know, does that really make a difference? Like, is that really going to impact me? You know, we're seeing huge, <clears throat> huge rate differences in here. And the reality is, is in aggregate, like these things do affect things. Right. And so, you know, maybe worth, worth just touching on real fast shaggy is, you know, when that happens, like what's the actual adjustment that happens if we raise rates, you know, 50 basis points, for instance, what actually happens then? Right. Like why is, why does that decrease, decrease demand? Yeah. So, um, so in essence, uh, if you just kind of take a step back, um, you know, when you put money in a bond or you save money, you put money in the bank, you, you, you get some type of interest rate. Um, well, if your interest rate that you're getting is zero, which it has been, there's not much of an incentive to save any money. You're better off probably just spending it um, rather than putting it in a bank and earning, earning zero. Um, or, or you would invest it in equities or more risk-oriented ass, um, assets where you can get some type of return. Well, when interest rates start going up and, um, you know, maybe I can make 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%, you pick the number. At some point, you know, people start getting interested. Uh, and they're like, well, I don't need to take uh, the risk in the equity side. Uh, I'll just go sit my money in the bank and earn a safe uh, uh, return. Uh, you also have companies that, you know, if they can borrow, if rates are very low, they can borrow money extremely cheaply. Well, even individuals can with, with, with homes, right? You know, when rates are, when you can get a two and a half percent mortgage, a company can borrow at very low rates. Well, you can afford more. You can buy a bigger home. You can spend more on a home. Companies can um, either buy back their shares, uh, they can buy other companies, uh, they can reinvest in their business, right? But uh, when they start having to pay 5%, 6%, 7%, well, you're not going to be able to afford as much of a home. Companies are not going to invest in much in those other types of uh, activities that I mentioned because it's not as profitable. So it really slows down essentially the spending of money and shifts it more to the saving of money. That's awesome. Thank you for uh, for teasing that out. So, okay. So the question, of course, is, is like, where do you think things are going to go as it re relates to, you know, rate hikes or any other adjustments that are being made? And I'm actually going to tie in Ross's question as well into this, because I think it, it bridges well, which is, um, how would we expect, I guess, NFT markets in this case, as an example, and, and this, you can, you know, respond to this in a generalized manner, but how would you expect NFT markets to adjust as rates get hiked, for instance? Will it be a sudden adjustment, do you think? Will it be gradual? That, that kind of a thing. Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned, we're not going to be able to fix the supply side. So we have to we fix the demand side. Um, how we're going to do that is by raising rates, as you mentioned. We've had just one uh, rate increase, um, 25 basis points. Nobody even notices 25 basis points uh, for the most part. Um, but rest assured, much, much more is coming uh, because we must get inflation uh, down to a reasonable level, which means we have to just decrease the demand uh, for goods and services in the economy. Um, so, you know, the Fed has, um, if the Fed's going to be the primary uh, entity, at least here in the U.S., that works on this problem, um, uh, they are going to raise rates by 50 basis points. In May, they're going to raise rates by 50 basis points in June. Uh, they're probably going to raise rates by 50 basis points in July, and they're going to keep raising um, after that uh, as well. Um, now, when the Fed does something, 
it takes nine to 12 months before it really shows up in the economy. So uh, you can see uh, the economy uh, and, and, you know, risk assets, I think, still have some more runway here. Uh, but the Fed's going to start hitting the brakes. Um, and it's not just rates. Uh, the Fed, uh, I think I want to touch on as well, uh, because I think it's enormously important and people don't uh, fully appreciate what's happened over the last couple of years and what's going to happen. Uh, it's not just rates, but the Fed has a balance sheet. Uh, that they essentially, uh, if we could think of it simply, uh, they just pump money or liquidity into the economy. Um, and they do that uh, because, you know, um, one, it helps everything work better and it helps kind of prop up riskier assets. Um, and that uh, tends to help the economy overall. Uh, and so the, the Fed over the last uh, couple of years has pumped in essentially, you know, four to five trillion dollars worth of liquidity. It's massive, um, it's a scale we've never seen before. Uh, to me, this was probably the the single biggest impact to why uh, we've done so well, why stock market has done so well post COVID, why the economy has done so well, uh, and quite frankly, now why we have inflation. Well, the Fed, uh, in addition to raising rates, is going to start taking that money away. Um, and uh, they're going to take it away um, beginning in, uh, in really May. Uh, so they haven't started yet. They're going to start taking it away. Uh, if they, uh, you know, and, and as this money comes out uh, at a fairly fa fast pace, it's something we've never seen before, ever. So it's difficult to say exactly how markets re will react. Uh, but my guess is that, you know, as this liquidity gets taken out of the markets, well, you know, that is going to be a headwind for riskier assets. And so how does it relate back to NFTs? Um, you know, NFTs are so interesting. We have these, I would say these micro cycles in NFTs that don't really relate to the broader economy. Um, yeah, at least that's what I've seen over the last nine to 10 months that I've been here. I see many, many booms and busts in such a short period of time. Well, that's not, uh, that's not the macro economy, uh, but I am concerned and I don't know exactly how NFTs are going to react. I am concerned when uh, we start seeing the broader economy uh, be slowed uh, and we see uh, a headwind for risk assets in the broader economy. Uh, I do think it will have an impact on, um, uh, on, on NFTs and specifically the liquidity. Um, liquidity is everything, as you know. Um, and, um, you know, if... Uh, if things are getting more challenging in the more macro environment, you know, I have to imagine that, you know, that will make the NFT market more challenging uh, as well uh, over uh, through that period. Um, but again, we've never seen this in history uh, or the, the NFT market has really never been uh, uh, exposed to. Uh, this type of uh, macroeconomic cycle ever in history because it's such a, a brand new young market. So it's hard to say exactly uh, because we have no history to, to guide us there. Shaggy, can you, one specific point in there, you know, regarding the balance sheet and the Fed pulling pulling money out, can you just connect what that means to, to markets? What does is, what is pulling money uh, out mean in this case? Yeah, so I won't go into all the mechanics. You feel free to hit me up uh, if you want to dive deep on the mechanics here. But uh, essentially, uh, to keep it simple, um, the Fed pumped, they put trillions of dollars into the economy, uh, $4 trillion of cash, basically. Think of it as, as liquidity. Uh, and, you know, liquidity is king. When you have liquidity, people feel great. They buy risk. Um, that liquidity has to find a home, especially when rates are zero. There's no point in, in holding it in cash or sticking it in bonds, right? You just you, you want to go out and all that new cash, you go spend it on, uh, on risky assets. Well, uh, now the reverse is going to happen. They're going to take that cash out of the system. So I talked about too much cash chasing uh, too few goods. Uh, well, you start to take that money out of the economy, well, now you have less cash uh, chasing goods. So it's another way to slow things down, essentially. And um, it will be a headwind, I believe, for risk markets uh, as things get into full gear. Um, uh, my best personal thought, uh, probably, you know, in the fall sometime when things start to hit a little, hit a little closer to home. That's awesome. Um, okay, so... 
one thread that I'm like starting to see here a little bit in the questions and that I think, you know, you know, our group, right? We have like a range of people in here, different experience and different ages and all that. And that's what makes this place, you know, so awesome uh, to be in and learn. But um, one thread that I'm kind of seeing it come across here that I think would be useful is talking about the different different elements of risk within various assets. So for instance, if we had a spectrum that existed, right, and then one end of the spectrum, we would probably have something like NFTs, right, which are high risk and everyone knows that. Other end of the spectrum might be, you know, like a CD or, you know, even some bonds in some cases, right? But what are, what are the layers of risk that kind of exist in these cases, right? Like for each of these items, and I'd even include something, you know, common one that comes up is like, you know, staking, right? Uh, and getting 7% APY on, you know, your on your stable coins, for instance, or whatever APY on something else. So uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'm happy to do this with you, but I just kind of wanted to tease out the layers of risk that exist. And I'll, I guess I'll lead in by saying, like, if you contrast, you know, staking, for instance, right, uh, of a stable coin, well, you have a couple layers of risk that exist there, right? First off, it's not, you know, if you put your money in a bank, at least in the U.S., it's FDIC insured, which means if anything happens to it, you're backed up to 250K, Shaggy, I think it is. Uh, that's right that's right yep 250k and so you're basically you're going to get whatever interest rate is that that's promised you Mo won't be a lot historically and it sounds like it's going to be increasing a little bit but it's it's fully backed right at the end of the day if you contrast that with staking for sta uh, stable coins for instance right you don't have that 250k worth of insurance let's call it right it's an institution that's kind of unknown we know there are hacks and things like that that exist and no you know central party that you can go to to complain so you know on the spectrum of crypto and, and risk assets and NFTs, you know, staking USDC would probably be the safest thing that could possibly exist. But if you contrast it to other things, it might not be as safe, right? So I just wanted to touch on that a bit, Shaggy, and any thoughts you have there, just so people can start to pull apart, right? Not just like the, the generalized different risk levels that exist, but kind of why the things have a little bit of a, a varying risk and, and maybe a little bit of how to think about that. Sure. Yeah. I always think of, um, I always like to tell everybody, uh, and this is a generality, uh, but you know, if you are getting a higher return, you're probably taking on more risk. Uh, markets are generally efficient. Um, the NFT market and some of these micro markets, yeah, there are, um, there are opportunities, there are inefficiencies to be exploited, but generally, uh, more return, more potential return, more yield, you're taking more risk. Uh, simple as that. Um, and yes, there are all sorts of different uh, uh, variations of risk uh, from, like you said, a bank deposit uh, to you know, an unsecured bond, which is going to be a little riskier. You can get a little bit more return. And equity, obviously yeah. riskier. You should be getting more return over time. You know, digital assets, I think, are riskier. More return over time. NFTs, riskier. More return over time. Uh, but, you know, again, that uh, we talk about the, the good side of risk, uh, the, that being the potential return. Uh, you know, people often don't think about the bad side of risk, uh, which is, of course, uh, the downside, the volatility uh, to the downside. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that, that's the simplest because there are just so many areas. Somebody thinks, oh, I'm getting this, this great return over here um you know uh, this is this is like the holy grail but you know there's risk there whether you've identified the risk or not if you're getting a good return uh, you're taking more risk uh i think back uh to you know uh if you want to look something up uh, back in the in the 90s uh, there was a group long term capital management and now these guys were extremely bright um you know phd's um, you know, from the best schools, uh, they put together a hedge fund, uh, and they thought uh, they had um, a great way uh, to make uh, a great return, and it worked until it didn't. Uh, <laughs> and there's always the chance uh, for the black swan event, for the event uh, that you know you don't anticipate or you think will never happen to happen, and it tends to happen more often than uh, most people expect those events to happen. And when those happen, uh, you find out where your risk uh, really is. Uh, and so uh, it kind of just goes back. If, you, if you're making a return, if you're making a yield that seems great, you know, just understand where your risk is coming from because you are likely taking uh, risk. You just may not have identified the risk you're taking yet.
Yeah, that, that's a great explanation. I think you're tying it to like what we do, we do in here, right, with NFTs. I mean, I think like one way we could think about those layers of risk too for NFTs as an example w- would be something like, you know, the stuff that we analyze on a daily basis, right? And that can include everything from like project, you know, who, who the project managers and devs are to what's the structure of their, their roadmap to can they pull off the roadmap? To, is there an execution risk that exists to is the price too high compared to what we're getting and the upside, you know, that layer of risk. But then beyond it, there's this, you know, is the NFT narrative going to continue to push? Like, are, are, are more people coming into the market? And then it goes to even the layer above that, of course, which is something like, you know, do people have disposable income and to be able to put into things that are, you know, riskier assets like NFTs or, or crypto or things like that? So, you know, there's just like a few layers of that that exist beyond, beyond just, you know, the, the individual projects that we analyze by themselves or against other projects. I think it's just worth being kind of mindful of that, um, you know, for anybody in here. So, okay. So I guess we'll hit on a couple questions that are in here as well. I want to make sure we have time and I'm forecasting other questions will come out as well. So let's maybe start with Ryan's question. I think it's, it's applicable to, you know, what, what we just talked about, which is, uh, he says, is there a true inflation hedge out there or do most markets dip along with it? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Um, there are there are some true inflation hedges, um, but uh, they're going to be difficult, and they're probably not something you're going to want to be uh, invested in, honestly, um, because you really have to understand the mechanics and what's going on. <clears throat> There's things like Treasury inflation protected securities, uh, where you essentially are. Protected at least against CPI, which is the consumer price index. Um, I think, um, and I don't want to get in the weeds here. I think many people will find that uh, the ex- inflation they experience uh, might be uh, not quite matched up with uh, the consumer price index. Uh, things like healthcare and education, things like that, tend to inflate uh, at a much higher level, and that's what a lot of people are exposed to. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, real estate tends to be a pretty good inflation hedge. Um, And so there are some assets out there. Um, I don't want to get the technicalities because we can get pretty deep in those. I will just say this, though. Um, I know everyone's worried about inflation now and for good reason. But, you know, inflation is going to be broken. It's going to be brought down. It's going to be back to 2 to 3%. Um, now, whether that takes two years, three years, four years, and how painful it is to get there, you know, we'll see. But I do not anticipate that, you know, we are going to be uh, in an environment where inflation remains elevated for an extended period of time. That's that's great explanation. Um, I, I'm just going to build one other thing on top of that, too, or maybe one other lens to possibly look at, at inflation to some extent, which is uh, identifying and this is this is tricky. It actually ties back to Shaggy's comment about black swans and the fact that we don't know what they're what they're going to be. Just that they will exist over time and they come up a bit more frequently than, than we expect. And so, one other maybe lens to look at uh, a hedge, not just against inflation, but a hedge against maybe anything, might be identifying what the pain point is there that you project. Right. So, if you think, just as an example, and not that you could predict this, but if you just think that at some point oil is going to be a problem and oil prices are going to shoot up then for you particularly, that may be something you want to hedge against as an example, right? So almost identifying where you think there may be an issue and then, you know, protecting against the, the opposite of that might be one other way to, to possibly look at it too. So, okay. So Lizard King, uh, recent pretty good win in here as well. Congrats. Um, so Lizard King asks, when you say buy bonds, and this is earlier you said this, but when you say buy bonds, when you expect interest rates to drop, what do you recommend buying specifically? Corporate bond ETFs. So a bit more of a technical question, of course. Yeah, I mean, there are um, there are so many different types of bond products. Um, I think for most individual investors, especially if you're not overly sophisticated, yeah, you you know using kind of ETF markets or mutual funds are going to be uh, generally uh, the kind of easiest uh, point of entry. Um, I will also say there's very one very important uh, dynamic in bonds uh, investing that everyone uh, that wants to invest in bonds should know. And that is simply 
that um, a, a long-term bond is much more price sensitive to interest rate movements than a short-term bond. So uh, if you are investing in uh, some of those products, uh, uh, generalities that we mentioned, you know, you make certain that you understand uh, how long in terms of maturity, uh, we use a technical term called duration in the bond market, uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the simpler way to think of it is maturity. Uh, make sure uh, that you understand what you're buying, because if you are buying very short maturity, short duration funds, uh, they will not be very sensitive to those interest rate movements. If you buy a very long maturity, very long duration funds, they will be extremely sensitive to interest rate movements. So uh, this is something if you're uh, thinking about investing in bonds, uh, you must know uh, this concept and how this works. Uh, so you understand what you're investing in. That's excellent. Um, so, okay, one other thing that Lizard King asks as well is people have said that interest rates have to equal inflation before inflation can start to go down again. Is this true? I don't understand why they would have to exactly equal each other. Well, I mean, this is um, uh, some people speculate or some people uh, would postulate that, yes, uh, you know, rates need to be at or above inflation before inflation comes down. Um, you know, this uh, you will see. I mean, I, I don't think anybody can tell you uh, how high uh, and how aggressive the Fed is going to have to be to essentially break inflation. Um, uh, we can make some speculation, but nobody knows the answer. Uh, the Fed doesn't know the answer. No one else knows the answer. Uh, the interesting thing about this time, uh, of course, is it's coming from the supply side as well. Um, and so, you know, can some of those supply problems uh, be fixed over time? That could help alleviate and naturally bring inflation down. Um, and thus, you know, the Fed would not have to get as aggressive to bring it back uh, down into reasonable levels. So uh, there are a lot of dynamics here. Uh, there are no certainties. There are no uh, good answers. Uh, the only thing I'm quite confident on is that the Fed is going to get very aggressive here uh, over the next uh, five to six months. Uh, they have no other choice. Uh, very confident in that. Um, and, um, you know, if they are going to have to keep going after that is going to depend on, you know, if the numbers start improving, uh, especially from an inflation perspective. But I don't think anyone can tell you with certainty the answer. So I think a, a good segue from that question is, is Tyler's question, actually. Uh, and Tyler asks, he says, comment, please, on where you see digital assets if we see a full-blown commodity pr crisis due to raising funding rates, playing tug of war with quantitative tightening, um, if you can answer that. Yeah, so um, I don't really foresee a commodity crisis. Um, you know, commodities have done extraordinarily well. Uh, if anything, we uh, almost certainly have a, um, a lack of supply there. Uh, so even as inflation and demand comes down, I don't think they come down enough uh, to cause, uh, I assume when you say commodity crisis, you're talking about uh, a decrease in in demand. There, uh, I don't, I don't think and, and that should be of much of a concern. Can you also, Shaggy, just call out for everyone in here like, what commodities are, uh, just so we're on the same page as well? Yeah, so commodities are like your raw, raw goods. So oil, you know, iron ore, you know, basically the kind of the building blocks of. Of, of everything else. Um, and so that's typically what, you know, they go into everything, right? Uh, energy, um, oil, um, you know, food commodities, right? Your grains, right? So uh, basically like the, the starting building block for everything. So, you know, when you have this um, uh, commodity uh, prices go up, well, naturally inflation, you know, prices are gonna get more expensive because it goes into almost everything we do. Uh, so, um, you know, it's it's worthwhile watching, um, and there are some uh, clear uh, supply issues right now for all sorts of reasons. Um, but you know, when you say crisis, uh, you know, if we start bringing down demand, that should limit the upside in commodities. But I don't I don't foresee a a sudden departure uh, or a huge uh, fall in price in commodities either uh, for all sorts of reasons. So Tyler just goes on a little bit to say costs of borrowing to insure and ship commodities are raising enormously, but banks won't have the liquidity if tightening continues. Um, so he just calls out that one point. Ty Tyler, if you, go ahead. Go ahead check, check. No, I mean, the, there's no question. I mean, that's that's inflation, right? So commodities uh, uh, is costing more. You're seeing commodity prices increase. 
Um, you know, liquidity, that's always something worthwhile watching. Uh, there's plenty of liquidity now. There are all sorts of metrics I watch on liquidity, and I see no no concerns on, on liquidity front now. Um, but we'll see what happens as, as the Fed pulls back. Um, but, you know, banks have a funny way about making money um, because, uh, you know, uh, as interest rates rise, well, uh, what they charge uh, rises as well. So they're making kind of a spread on that net interest margin. Um, uh, what they're most interested in is, of course, uh, the credit quality of who they're uh, lending money to uh, to make sure they're getting paid back. But, you know, banks uh, banks can operate in all sorts of different um, interest rate environments because, well, they simply uh, charge more than their cost. Okay. And so thank you for that. And so one other, you know, one other comment that, or, you know, concept that people always think about is, is bubbles, right? I mean, everybody in every market thinks about bubbles and what that's like. And, you know, Ryan in here connected it to the physical collectibles boom originally, consequently elevating the alternative asset marketplace, which I guess then would, would tie into NFTs as a result. And so I guess what are your thoughts or comments about bubble? Is that here uh, or is that is that going to come at some point? Is, you know, is, are there any lessons to be learned from... Uh, from tulips and and that whole world in the 1600s, I think it was. Uh, what what are your thoughts there? Yeah, this is a great question. This is one I think a lot about uh, when it comes uh, to NFTs because one NFTs are extremely new, uh, yet uh, quite frankly, some of the the prices I see you know uh, seem to defy logic. Um, yet uh, that is where the market's clearing them at, so uh, it is what it is. It must respect that, uh, but. Um, you know, the funny thing about bubbles is, and I'm not suggesting the NFT market isn't in a bubble. Uh, you never know if you're in a bubble or not until uh, after the fact, because uh, when you're in the bubble itself, you know, nobody recognizes it really that it's a bubble or very few people uh, recognize uh, that it's a bubble. Uh, but almost certainly um, being such a brand new kind of uh, asset class, if you will, uh, or world, NFT world, there will be bubbles. Uh, there will be periods where um, we see significant price declines, even for high quality projects, um, uh, without question. Um, now, is that uh, price decline come, you know, uh, let's just take Bored Apes. Does it come from uh, 125, you know, down to 50 or uh, do they go uh, to 300 and then go back down to 150? Right. You know, you don't you don't really know. Um, with certainty uh, until after the fact. But uh, I mean, there's almost uh, almost without question, you know, there are areas, I think, within the NFT market where excesses are building. Now they can continue to build for many years. Uh, I'm not suggesting uh, they have to they have to burst um, uh, within a short period of time, but burst they will at some point. It's almost inevitable. Uh, and the one kind of if I relate this back to the macro, you know, an environment in which the broader economy is struggling uh, by design, it must struggle. It must. We must go to uh, you know very low or likely negative growth here in the U.S. Uh, to combat inflation. Um, it, it seems uh, a very high probability at this point uh, to me. Uh, that type of environment, you know, those tend to be environments where you know bubbles, if they do exist. Um, uh, have a higher potential to be exposed um, and to correct. So uh, this is something I'm thinking a lot about uh, for sure uh, when I think about NFTs, about my approach to NFTs. Um, but you know, you know, the the, the you, you never realize it when you're in it, and you can never tell uh, when it, it's going uh, to pop, so to speak. Yeah. So I guess with that with that in mind, right? For anybody in here, again, knowing that we have different backgrounds in here right some some people are, are strictly nfts so far and that's like their initial you know move into investing let's call it and some people are nfts in crypto and some are nfts crypto and you know web 2 equities bonds native whatever else it is right i mean what what is your what is your thought there as it pertains to you know planning and, and having you know a bit of balance or at least forecasting for a bubble not necessarily what your advice is of course not um but more specifically, just what's a way to think about it to make sure, you know, that you're balanced uh, and, and, you know, protected and just considering risk, I guess, is, is what I would say. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the same tenets of regular investing apply to NFTs, um, you know, diversification, uh, you know, taking profits, essentially rebalancing. Uh, and most important, I think, you know, you as an individual, you know, you have to think very hard about your ideal kind of investment mix um, because there may be individuals out there that, you know, they put 100% of their net worth into NFTs. If it goes to zero, they're fine. You know, um, they don't have a lot of, uh, you know, real life responsibilities, mortgage payments, um, you know, putting kids through school, etc. You know, and there may be other individuals that have a significant amount of kind of real life, uh, if you will, um, uh, uh, expenses and responsibilities. And, you know, you, I, I, if you're in that type of situation, you know, it doesn't make sense to put a, a, a massive percentage of your net worth or investable assets into extremely risky asset classes, right? So, you know, there is, um, uh, whenever you invest, whether it's in NFTs or anything else, um, you know, if, it, it, you know, um, you, I think you have to think about your, what we call your asset allocation, uh, and understand, you know, uh, what your personal risk tolerance is, what you are willing to see in terms of volatility and potential losses and illiquidity, um, and then what's appropriate, right? Because I can, you know, with certainty, the more risk you take, the more potential return you have. Um, but also, again, the more risk you take, <laughs> the more downside and the the more illiquidity. So if you do need, you know, let's say you, let's say you have, um, uh, you know, a, a certain amount of expenses you have to meet uh, per year, you know, to lock all your assets up in an extremely risky asset class um, is just not prudent. It's uh, maybe you're leaving some return on the table by moving into some safer assets. But, you know, in, in periods of of downside in periods of volatility uh, to the downside in periods where people are risk off, people are worried, you know, you'll be glad, you'll be very glad you had uh, those uh, quote unquote uh, safer asset classes to kind of meet uh, the needs uh, you might have or reduce the volatility in your portfolio. Um, so I think everyone, you know, you you have to decide that what's what's right for you in your situation, it is not a one size fits all approach. Yeah, it's a great explanation. And I just want to be clear to people too, right? Like part of the reason why we're, we're having numbers therapy and we're talking about topics like this and we'll talk about others too is, you know, we're all really lucky. We're in, we're in a really cool position here, right? Where we've identified a market that we think is going to change the future technologically. And because we're early, right? We have these opportunities that exist. The market is a bit more efficient, right? But as a result of that, like we're going to, you know, many of us in here will be fortunate enough to have money to be able to put into other things. And so I just think it's it's really important right now to understand what those other avenues are and, you know, where we could potentially put our money in the future beyond just NFTs, which it's not saying not just in, not NFTs at all, but what other things we could put our money into as well. And really having that understanding, you know, while we're in a good position, basically, and planning ahead. So uh, maybe we'll just do one last question, Shaggy, from Ryan. He asks... Uh, what are alternative assets that you're looking into, NFA, but anything that's got you excited? So may maybe a, a way to reframe that question is, what, what are the different buckets of, of assets or alternative assets that you kind of see out there? And like, how might one think about it? And is there anything that you think is interesting? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm here, right? NFTs, I think NFTs, I think digital assets, uh, I, I, I do believe that... Um, you know, we are going to see industries transformed because of them. Uh, so um, this is kind of the new um, kind of up and coming uh, technology. Uh, it hasn't really been applied, I don't think, on a practical wide scale basis yet. Uh, what does the future uh, look like? Um, I think about that a lot and I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't think the future to me is uh is pictures, uh, but it's here today, and I'm happy to participate in it while I try to figure out what the future is. Um, so to me, like, that is kind of where I'm focusing. I mean, there are, um, to the extent that you, 
um, you know, uh, look at other alternative type of investments in the traditional world, then you're talking about private equity, private debt, you're talking about hedge funds, things like that. Um, I don't know if there are anything to get super excited about, uh, but you know, those are kind of kind of more uh, kind of the the tools in the toolbox of you know what larger, more traditional investors uh, use. But um, yeah, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm here because to me it's exciting, it's fun. Uh, there's a future here. I think it's going to change. Uh, it's going to change industries, um, and uh, I just love kind of learning and watching and and seeing what's happening. Um, I think you know, interestingly enough, I think what we're going to see. Um, is uh, especially uh, with the success of the Moonbirds, uh, we are going to see a rush of, uh, of venture capitalists uh, entering the space to raise money. Essentially, now typically you would raise money, uh, you know, kind of through kind of uh, angel investing or kind of traditional securities investing, um, but now there's this medium where a company, if you will, if you want to call them companies, they're startups, they can essentially raise tremendous amounts of money without giving up any equity in their company. I mean, uh, this is uh, this is mind boggling uh, and how this develops and how this is kind of an entry point into those companies uh, will be something I'll be watching closely. That's awesome. Uh, and I think maybe just one one thought or way to wrap that up too is you know, and Shaggy's touched on this, right? Like right now, we're, we're lucky to be in this environment and the markets were early. And as a result of us being early, the markets are inefficient. And so there's all this opportunity to stay on top of it, do the things we're doing, whitelist, hunt, all those good things. And I think over time, right, whenever we, we've seen this with Top Shot as a good example, right? Like anytime there's really inefficient markets where there's a lot of money, people say, ooh, there's a lot of money. Like, why don't I jump in, right? And I think, you know, over time, we'll probably see, see something similar here where people get excited by it and enter. Uh, and it'll make the markets probably a bit more efficient, right? Which means it's a little bit harder to be able to trade as effectively. Not that there's not opportunity, but a little bit harder. But I think one of the other things to consider beyond just like the different investment pathways that we've been talking about in here is one other asset that, that we're going to have as a result of this, because we're in here, is you know the combination of like connections and knowledge right and so the, the the people who are still going to continue to get paid in this space even beyond just the trading that we're doing now are going to be the builders too and so i i think it's just one other call it way to diversify for lack of a better description is to build continue to build connections to continue to learn in this space knowing that if the trading market becomes a little bit more efficient there's plenty of opportunity to build and create awesome things for which you can you know you can raise capital like shaggy said and uh, and, and make money in other ways too, and really grow your business. So um, we'll, we'll stop there. I think Shaggy, uh, thank you so much, man, for, uh, for your time today and running down everything. I think, you know, the questions that we got and everything were, were just indicative of how awesome, you know, you are certainly. And uh, thank everybody for, for the questions and for staying so engaged here. And if anybody has any feedback on structure or other ideas, you know, please feel free to drop me a line. And um, otherwise we're going to see you at numbers therapy too, coming up soon. Thanks, everyone.